friends, today is an opportunity to reflect on the relationships among the persons of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Especially on this, the solemnity of the Most Holy Trinity, we are invited to pray about the relational nature of God and find inspiration to strengthen our relationships with God and one another. Most Christians, I think, find the Trinity perplexing, sort of like an odd math problem. One divided by three is one. Or one plus one plus one equals one. Religion cheaters dutifully treat this major belief of our faith as something that needs to be explained, presenting a teaching challenge. They sometimes use the simple and folksy imagery of St. Patrick's three-leafed shamrock, or they use the highly technical language of philosophy by describing the Trinity as the hypostatic union and the communication of properties, or more often, resorting to simply declaring that it's a mystery. Perhaps the 20th century French philosopher Gabriel Marcel can be helpful here as one who is deeply committed to distinguishing problem from mystery. He says that a problem is something that we can put at arm's length and analyze or examine objectively. Safely landing astronauts on the moon or accurately landing the Perseverance Mars rover are modern day examples of a problem. A mystery is something that is so close to us, something in which we are we are so bound up that we actually become part of the question. The mystery of the Holy Trinity addresses the fundamental question of who am I? By saying that each one of us is a recipient of God's creative, redemptive, and sanctifying love. Creative because scripture's first verses in the book of Genesis attest to God's creative power. We see that vital creative power reenacted in our own natural world. Every spring is the flowers, leaves, trees, and bushes burst forth. Redemptive because scripture also tells us that God, whom the Hebrew, Hebrew people saw as the creator, sustainer of everything, pitched a tent among us, came to us in human flesh to bring healing, mercy, and redemption, and sanctifying love, because our God lives among us as the spirit of love, energizing the church. Maybe using a bad analogy of the Energizer Bunny. And inspiring each one of us to continue God's work here on earth. In our first reading from the book of Deuteronomy, also known as the second book of laws, Moses addresses the Jewish nation on the eve of their entrance into the land of Israel following 40 years wandering in the desert. After recounting the history they have lived since their deliverance from slavery in Egypt, Moses exhorts them to fix in their hearts their fundamental belief as a people that the Lord is God in the heavens above, on the earth below, and that there is no other 
Their adherence to monotheism set the Jewish people apart from the inhabitants of neighboring lands who worshiped many gods. In the gospel, Jesus tells his disciples that they are to initiate people into new life in Christ with the Trinitarian formula. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. That same baptismal formula that our adult catechumens heard last week at the Saturday Extended Vigil Mass on Pentecost. The same baptismal formula that the elect heard at our past Easter Vigil. That same baptismal formula that our parents and godparents heard at our own infant baptism. Although the one God has been revealed to us Christians as creator, redeemer, and sanctifier, we continue to affirm that this triune God is one. The theologian Elizabeth Johnson writes in her book entitled Quest for the Living God the following. It is all the one God, but we use a triple mode of address of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to signal the threefold way God has self-communicated in history. Today's Psalm 33 proclaims of the kindness of the Lord, the earth is full. As Christians, we experience the fullness of God through the mystery of the Holy Trinity. We understand God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to be a relationship of love that overflows to animate all of creation. In our own life of faith and prayer, how do we experience God's kindness in creation? Referring back to the first reading, our thriving is linked to keeping the statutes and commandments of God. For in this way, Moses tells the people, you and your children after you may prosper, and you will have long life on the land which the Lord your God is giving you forever. The last four verses of Matthew make up today's gospel reading. The disciples encounter the risen Christ on a mountain where they are commissioned to spread the good news. Jesus gives them authority and mandate to them to make disciples throughout the world, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This encounter has echoes of the giving of the law of Moses on Mount Horeb, which we also know as Mount Sinai, that is recalled in today's first reading. At this point in Matthew's Gospel, Mary Magdalene and another Mary had encountered an angel at the empty tomb who proclaimed the resurrection, who invited the women to witness the empty tomb and instructed them to inform the disciples as we read in, cha in Matthew chapter 28. Then the women met the risen Christ and embraced his feet and did him homage. Jesus reiterates the angel's command, asking the women to tell the 11 disciples to go to Galilee, where they will see him. However, even when the 11 obey these instructions and see Jesus, they worshiped and they doubted. These various instructions and reactions are worth close consideration. Obviously, the risen Christ could simply appear to the apostles and his disciples. Why have the women encounter Christ first and then tell the others? Scripture scholars tell us that embedded in Matthew's resurrection account is the spreading of the gospel in action. 
The women are the first Christian witnesses, and they model behavior for our discipleship. They encounter Christ and react with a mix of fear and joy, physically prostrating themselves in worship. More importantly, they cannot keep that experience to themselves, as they are twice told to tell the others. When the eleven encounter Christ, they worship, but also doubt the resurrection, a reaction recorded in more detail in John's Gospel story of Thomas doubting that we heard in John chapter 20, which we heard read on the second Sunday of Easter, also known as Divine Mercy Sunday. The disciples mirror how the Gospel would be received, with some accepting and others doubting the message. As in his encounter with the women, Jesus informs the other disciples that they cannot keep this message to themselves. They must make disciples in the name of the Holy Trinity, teaching so that others would come to know God on account of their Christian witness. Today's solemnity of the Most Holy Trinity and Gospel remind us that Jesus promises that we will not be abandoned, but rather supported by the Spirit of God until the end of time. Whenever we experience rebirth, when we are inspired to go out to the world with the message of God's love, when we are fired up to evangelize, we are caught up in the mystery of God's life-giving spirit within us. This is the spirit of God's love poured out in creation, poured out again in the blood of Jesus, and poured upon us in the waters of baptism. Earlier I mentioned that we're talking about a mystery Pope St. Paul VI called mystery, a reality imbued with the hidden presence of God. Perhaps we should qualify the word hidden. For this truth is not something as we read in Deuteronomy chapter 30, where it says, too mysterious or remote, not up in the sky or across the sea, so as to be inaccessible. No, it's something very near to us, already in our hearts. That's a mystery, not a problem. Just as we began today's liturgy with the sign of the cross, let us continue in our liturgy by celebrating the Eucharistic presence of the threefold God today. Praise be the sacred heart of Jesus, now and forever. Amen. Amen. 